Oh, uh, it's, we're right on 12 o'clock, so I'll kick off the um, in conversation with Senator um, Simon Birmingham, Federal Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. And thanks very much, everyone, for joining us today. It's wonderful to see so many faces from all over the state um, on one screen. Um, Today, it's um, with great pleasure that we have the Federal Minister join us and um, we'll go through a few preliminaries and then we'll hear directly from the Minister. For those of you that I don't know, my name's Sean DeBron. I'm the CEO of the Tourism Industry Council here in South Australia. And I'll be um, emceeing today's um, Zoom call with the Minister. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, Please um, put your mute button on. Um, I think there's a few people out there that don't have their mute button on. Please put your mute button on so that we don't get background noise and everyone can hear what's going on. Um, and secondly, I encourage you to use the chat function um, to, uh, to have a discussion online while everyone's speaking um, and to compare your thoughts and, uh, with others during the call. Tourism Industry Council of South Australia, we've got a number of events coming up, so just briefly want to highlight a few of those. Um, firstly, next week on the 10th of June, uh, we've got a free session um, all about nature-based tourism, a workshop with um, Minister Spears and um, uh, other people from government to look at what the South Australian government is doing around nature-based tourism. Hopefully you're all aware um, that there was an announcement uh, a week and a half ago now where the government announced a co-investment fund of $5 million for tourism operators to work with the department to deliver new and improved visitor experiences across the state. The session on the 10th of June will unpack that, if you like, and will highlight um, the ways in which industry can get involved um, and can work with government over the next couple of years and receive support in doing so. Mm. so please um, <clears throat> put that in your diary. The, um, the second thing I wanted to highlight was an announcement that came out last night from the South Australian Tourism Commission about um, um, SA Health has developed a principles for transport and tour vehicles. This was published um, late last night. It's something that industry has been calling for. And I think that I've had a number of responses this morning. I think everyone in, um, who's in the tour indus touring industry or the non-essential transport space has very much welcomed this announcement from the government overnight <coughs> and by the South Australian Tourism Commission and given um, businesses in, in that area some certainty in terms of the way in which they'll be able to operate moving forward. This is on top of the government's announcement um, from a week ago where Treasury announced um, a waiver of passenger transport operator accreditation and annual fees for a 12 month period for eligible operators. Um, again, some support for the tour and transport sector. The detail is yet to be finalised and that'll be coming, as we understand, it'll be coming out from the Department of um, Planning Transport Infrastructure, so Minister Canole's area, and will be published on the state government website um, where all the COVID information is appearing at the moment. So two very welcome announcements from the government um, overnight to support our industry. The last um, element that I really wanted to highlight, and I highlighted it um, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking with Premier Marshall, um, is the COVID clean program that TIC SA released um, in partnership with all of the other tourism industry councils around the country, it's part of our quality tourism framework. We're really pleased we've had an exceptionally busy period registering businesses. We currently have 139 businesses that have signed up for that program. Um, and we've got 31 that have already achieved COVID accreditation um, since we've released it. The program, um, um, is focused on five key elements for businesses to be COVID clean. Um, that's staff training. It's about cleaning equipment and products. 
It's about cleaning, cleaning processes and um, procedures and methods. There's a checklist and there's a risk register. I encourage you um, to uh, register your interest for the COVID clean um, accreditation and to undertake it as it will really help industry to reassure consumers that um, they're safe and well looked after when they come and do an experience with us. Um, now, um, I would like to hand over to the Chairman of the Tourism Ministry Council, who's sitting next to me, um, Owen Loftus, to say a few words um, to open the session today. Thanks, Owen. Brilliant. Thanks, Sean. And welcome, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces and that were with us a couple of weeks ago when we had our uh, hookup video conference with the Premier and uh, Tourism Minister. Um, so it's great today, really, to get a federal perspective on the recovery of our sector moving forward, coming out of the bushfires, drought, and now COVID. For tourism businesses, I think a couple of key areas, and we certainly saw it in the questions that came through, uh, will be about, from a federal perspective, international borders. Uh, when will they reopen? What will be the timing? And how will the uh, China market especially look as that recovers uh, giving uh, uh, trade negotiations that are going on. And very importantly, in, in keeping a lot of tourism businesses going, the JobKeeper payments uh, currently through to the 27th September. It would be interesting to get a federal perspective on if not all sectors are going to have an extension of JobKeeper, will the tourism sector, uh, tourism and hospitality, which has been hit so hard. So. Uh, I think it's great timing to uh, have the Federal Minister uh, for Tourism, the Honourable Simon Birmingham, to uh, speak with all of us today. Welcome to the Minister. Thanks, um, thanks very much, uh, Sean. Thanks, Owen, and, uh, and hello, everybody. It's nice to, uh, to see uh, some of you, and thanks for taking the time out to uh, join this discussion, which, uh, which I hope we can keep uh, an engaging one. Uh, I'll try to keep my remarks uh, minimal. Um, and, uh, and then we can, uh, can jump to questions and other things that are more um, uh, interested, more engaging. Look, um, firstly, I just want to, uh, to say um, thank you uh, for um, wearing the brunt of so much that has happened over uh, recent months. I know this has been a, a terrible time for many um, tourism operators, many small businesses, um, and, uh, and of course, um, you know, you've been asked to carry an immense burden uh, as we have uh, worked, governments, federal and state, uh, to try to keep people safe and to, uh, to uh, achieve outcomes that uh, everyone should share some um, uh, pride in those outcomes that uh, Australia has not seen mass graves of uh, New York and has not uh, encountered the overflowing hospitals of, uh, of Europe and doesn't have a death toll or anything like the rest of the world. And, uh, and painful though uh, it is for many, um, the border closures in particular have played a key role uh, in that, in keeping uh, Australia safe from the uh, spread of COVID uh, and in allowing us to be able to then uh, suppress that spread uh, and to avoid the overwhelming health systems that have crippled uh, so many other parts of the world. And I hope that we can find the right mechanisms in time to be able to use that success to, uh, to our advantage as well, that, uh, uh, that the uh, recognition of Australia as and not only a place of exceptional experience, but also uh, as somewhere renowned for safety and reliability uh, is something that we need to make sure we trade on in the future. And that's part of the discussions that we're having through Tourism Australia and Australia at present as to how we frame uh, the, uh, the perceptions of Australia to the rest of the world uh, to come out of this with the, uh, the most positive launching pad uh, possible. From a federal perspective, uh, you know, whilst we've grappled with those difficult decisions of border closures and how we handle the health crisis. We, uh, we've always been very conscious that uh, because of the measures being put in place, uh, there's been an economic crisis created for, uh, for many as well. Uh, and I hope that for uh, those uh, on the call today uh, and for others across the state that uh, the JobKeeper payments, the small business payments, uh, the different financing options that have, uh, have been created uh, provide some lifeline to help people get through uh, this, uh, this really tough period um, and, uh, and enable you to at least uh, sustain 
um, your businesses in, the, in this state of hibernation. And on the more positive note, I hope that, uh, that as um, the state is at least now really stepping up the drive uh, for visitors and to get out and about across SA, that you're seeing some uptick in, in activity uh, and bookings and that the uh, Welcome Back campaign launched over the weekend by the state government uh, is starting to drive a greater uh, activation of bookings. Uh, federally, we're trying to support that uh, with uh, targeted Tourism Australia activities uh, um, to uh, build interest and desire. And we've been cautious with, uh, with funds at present. There's no point spending large leaks of uh, taxpayers' dollars on uh, marketing things that people can't get to or can't do. Um, but certainly building uh, interest. And uh, a couple of weeks ago now, uh, we had uh, a full weekend of uh, live from Australia activities that were live streamed um, uh, across Australia and around the world to try to build that, uh, that um, excitement, that interest uh, and that intention uh, to book amongst people when it is, uh, when it is uh, safe and when they are able to do so. Now, when will they be able to do so? I can't give you a clear answer on that. I wish that uh, I wish that I could. Uh, you would have seen that, uh, that I've been relatively public in, uh, in urging the states uh, to look, once they've successfully completed these current stages of opening up uh, their um, internal activities of, uh, of intrastate travel and of pubs and restaurants and, uh, and attractions and so on. And once they've successfully done that and safely done it, uh, presumably without any spike uh, in cases of COVID, uh, then I hope that they will move swiftly uh, to open up the interstate borders as well, uh, because we are very committed to stepping up at that time to really encourage uh, domestic travel across Australia uh, and to try to backfill the gap that is left by the absence of international visitors. We won't see international visitors back in some numbers for some time. We, we, uh, we will entertain the possibility of doing something with New Zealand. There might be other minor proposals that can be considered, uh, but it will take quite some time to get back to short stay, uh, holiday and leisure and business travel, uh, being able to safely come back uh, into Australia. Uh, obviously, vaccines and other things may impact the timing of all of that, um, but we are going to have to look as to how we drive the domestic travel market as far as we can. And for that, I'm conscious that, uh, that so long as restrictions remain in place, there are arguments about uh, the ongoing need uh, for programs like JobKeeper. Uh, and you would have seen that the PM and the Treasurer in the last couple of weeks have kept uh, that door open, singling out the tourism industry in their, in their comments uh, as an example of where extra assistance beyond the current September timeframe might be necessary. Uh, and these are the types of considerations that, uh, that the review of JobKeeper uh, will have, uh, have at present. Um, but that, uh, that's probably enough by way of intro remarks uh, from me. So I want to keep it engaging and uh, try to respond directly to your questions. But you know, thank you once again for what everybody has done during this time. Um, I hope things are, uh, are on the slight improve as uh, South Australians getting uh, out and about. Um, I've had more questions about my own holiday plans in the last uh, in the last week or two than I think I've ever had in the job. Usually, people despise, despise the idea that politicians might take a holiday, um, but <laughs> given me a chance to at least uh, uh, talk up a few little short breaks uh, around uh, around SA uh, in that uh, in that context, and we'll certainly keep doing so. And when we can, we will be stepping up hard uh, in encouraging uh, domestic travel from across the country and ultimately try to leverage those international opportunities back again too. Thanks very much, Minister. Um, before I get into the q and I might just bring um, Simon Westerway into the conversation as well. Um, for those of you that were at the um, industry summit we did in February, you would have saw Simon speak. Simon is the Executive Director of the Australian Tourism Industry Council, and he works across all the tourism industry councils I mean, the country, he has a lot to do with Minister Birmingham's office on an ongoing basis. And I just thought I'd give Simon an opportunity just to speak for a couple of minutes in terms of national advocacy that all the tourism industry councils are doing. Over to you, Simon. Well, cheers, Sean. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Minister, for those words and, and for the chance to join us this morning. Um, I will keep it brief. I'll, I'll stick to the, the two-minute memo 
Um, look, thanks. Just the, there's just a few things I guess we just wanted to, to add into that conversation. Um, uh, I think the industry really does acknowledge um, the work that the Commonwealth's doing, particularly a number of the ministers, including the Treasurer, the PM and yourself, uh, Minister, around where JobKeeper's going and, and the direction of that. Just to put a little bit of um, uh, rubber on the road there, uh, we've done pretty deep surveys of all of our state ticks, including the territories, and so consistent. Around two thirds of our member businesses have basically either been closed or been in hibernation. Uh, in essence, half of their workforces um, have been have been taken out um, as a result of the you know the, the crisis that we've we've, we've faced. Um, but the majority of them have been able to get into JobKeeper. There's obviously been some that had some difficulties because of seasonality. There's a general rule. Those that had the option to take on JobKeeper have done so. So we appreciate what a significant policy instrument it is and how costly it's been to the taxpayer. But I think. Thank you for those uh, ongoing words of support around it. We really think as we start this road back, um, and I'll leave quickly in the borders because that's the other big challenging one for us as an industry, is that we really do need um, that little bit of extra time to get the visitor economy back up and running. So thank you for that. Look, just on borders, and we appreciate, again, this has now become a state and territory issue. And look, I'm personally very conscious around South Australia obviously has a closed, hard border but you have a very strong interstate uh, industry. So in essence, I understand it's around about 52, 53 cents and every visitor dollar is spent by South Australians within South Australia. So you're lucky in a way that you can have that self-sustaining economy uh, in itself to be able to then move forward. But it's it's clear and really obvious that we've got to get to a position of a way Australia on borders. Um, ATIC's been pretty prominent in this space and will continue to do so. We've probably um, pushed hard against Queensland not for the theatre sport of it, but uh, more as much around the fact that they've been quite obstinate in, in, in the rationale. Um, and it's somewhat concerning around, they seem to be taking, uh, we believe, a bit of a, a, a tougher stance against the National Cabinet position on the road out. And we want to try to keep, keep, them, keep them honest on that because we know the importance of, of a Queensland open as part of the broader domestic market. Um, it's obviously South Australia is important as well. Probably two other quick ones is uh, the role of accredited bodies we think is going to become really important on the road out. So it's, it's organisations like ourselves that have accreditation. Our members are genuine members. They self-improve. They're resilient. Uh, our, our two recent um, COVID clean um, module and our uh, tourism recovery planning modules have been really well received by our existing 10,000 national membership base and uh, we've seen some really great, some people from outside of our um, our own organisations wanting to, to get into the program, which has been absolutely fantastic. And probably the fourth one is on those international borders. Uh, we're a big supporter of the Trans-Tasman bubble. We think it's the right thing to do. Whilst uh, probably the Western states of Australia don't receive the amount of uh, Kiwi visit of the traffic that the Eastern states do, it's the right thing to do and it's important that you know we have a, a timeline and a framework to get that back up and running and also in many ways a test case to then allow the as they call it now the green lanes um into into and out of asia and so forth because we've got to get international travel moving again at some point and the trans tasman is the right right place to do that um with the right um with, with you know some type of health or well-being passport or some type of use of strong use of technology our senate submission into the uh, COVID um, senate inquiry goes into this in some detail around technology's got to be our friend in this on the way back. And probably the, the, the fourth area, and it's probably not sort of touched on as much, um, is around longer term strategy uh, with tourism 2030. We, we get it, it's, it's not so much 2030's on hold, but that's important we get over the, 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 the dramatic issues that are now facing our sector. But um, we, we do want to encourage your minister to look at what the forward strategic plan can look like for industry, I think. Ross Tourism 2020 was developed under a previous government. Um, subsequent governments have really engaged a lot around it. It's, it's locked the feds as well as the various states into a, a national plan. Um, it's proven to be very successful. It's kept people aligned. It's helped support investment facilitation. And perhaps it may have to come in a couple of stages, um, but we do want to sort of, we'd love to see there's sort of uh, some forward progress on that, perhaps at the back end of this year, early next year, as much to give people some confidence around the direction of the industry and also to inform government and importantly, to sort of show how that roadmap is going to look um, as we as we move forward. Um, and finally, to Minister, just thanks again for your ongoing support for the industry. I know, well, we know how proactive you, you have been and getting right behind us. And uh, we'll continue to be the squeaky wheel as we need to be. But um, 
uh, as you well know, we're, we're an industry made up of SMEs and, um, you know, we're very passionate trade, but at the same time, we obviously know that these are very, very trying circumstances. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. Um, Minister, maybe I'll give you an opportunity just to respond to one or two points that Simon's made, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. Just um, uh, three uh, three quick topics that I'll cover off on there. Um, you know, job keeper and ongoing support. And so we said at the outset uh, that we would review job keeper in June, uh, and uh, and um, that it had a life initially set to run until September. So essentially, we're reviewing it around the halfway mark of uh, its initial life. Um, can I urge industry to engage in that review? The details of it will be out soon. Um, but I think it's important that there be many tourism industry voices uh, um, participating in that review process, making simple submissions, making it clear that um, government restrictions that limit the extent of travel and the extent of activity uh, and the number of people and all of those factors that you're dealing with um, are, of course, having a profound impact on ongoing revenue and that that looks like continuing past September. A JobKeeper was initially framed as something economy-wide um, with uh, relatively basic rules and terms around it in terms of the eligibility threshold and what the payments were like. I would anticipate that if there is to be an extension of it or something like it, uh, it will need to be a little bit more targeted, a little bit more proportionate. Uh, there will need to be some tapering aspects and so on to it. Um, so for particularly uh, the industry associations, uh, uh, ATIC and, uh, and the SA Council um, thinking about the policy positions you would advocate for that work most effectively uh, for your members is, is going to be an important part of participating in, the, in that review so that we get an outcome um, that, uh, that looks right for the industry um, but also for individual members uh, um, you know, where you can make a simple email submission if you like to that process um, it will be important to show just how much um, tourism industry uh, uh, values it. So PM and I have discussed it directly. He understands the tourism industry was really the first hit by COVID. It's likely to be the last out. Uh, and so he, he gets that. Um, but I think it's just important that uh, the industry is making its presence felt through that uh, review process to make sure we all get the right outcome. Um, on borders, uh, look, I, you know, I think, um, it's important uh, that we make clear the demand for, uh, for, you know, for orders to reopen as part of the normalisation uh, agenda, um, but it's got to be done in ways that, that carries public confidence. I understand that the states don't want to lose that, uh, that confidence in, uh, uh, in the safety of things as, uh, as matters reopen. Um, and you know, I've, after being relatively vocal on it uh, for a bit, have tried to just pivot uh, a little bit to make sure it's, uh, it's an encouragement as much as anything that, uh, that I think you know, there's a risk if everybody piles in on, uh, on states that they will kind of um, feel backed into a corner and it might actually be harder to get out of that corner than any of us would want. Um, so, uh, so I've you know, made clear where there are Labor premiers that, uh, that I'll sing their praises from the rooftops. They're the first ones to take steps uh, to, uh, to reopen uh, um, uh, borders in ways that get and tourists flowing. I think Simon made some, uh, some decent points about the fact that uh, you know, for SA, for many businesses, there's an immense opportunity while borders are closed to capitalise on that in part and to, to really uh, make sure you lock in um, intrastate activities and we try to build that enthusiasm. And we saw the willingness of South Australians to respond uh, uh, with the Book Them Out campaign that the state government ran earlier this year and hopefully the Welcome Back campaign can do likewise across uh, across all regions and, uh, and to deliver uh, those sorts of benefits. Um, the last point uh, in response to Simon's remarks I'd make is uh, is around the longer term strategy. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I had hoped, uh, intended that by this time this year we would have probably released the, the 2030 uh, strategy. Uh, we were very close to finalisation. Um, but, uh, but obviously there was no point in finalising and releasing a strategy where everybody would have laughed at the, uh, at the targets uh, that, uh, that were set in there, there and said that they uh, were nonsensical at a time like this. So just as the federal budget's been delayed until October, we've got to give the, uh, the long-term strategy now time for us to reconsider 
The fundamentals of you know, what Australia has to offer probably won't change. Uh, the fundamentals of who we want to target in terms of uh, you know, bringing in visitors uh, probably won't change. Um, but you know, what we see as the achievable targets and how we best go about it and how we best position Australia in doing so um, and what are the other areas of, uh, of industry development that are important for the future and how we stimulate investment to make sure we keep our tourism product uh, fresh and vibrant and attractive. And they're all kind of questions that we've really got to double down on. Uh, so we're working hard right now on the recovery phase and uh, more consultation on that to come uh, over the next little while and that recovery phase won't be a short few months. I know that's going to probably be uh, at least a, a couple of years um, and, uh, and following our work on the recovery phase we can really embed down some of those longer term questions about, uh, about what uh, a new 2030 strategy looks like. Thanks Minister. Uh, so I've got a bunch of questions that people sent in um, and um, I'll start with um, one to do with public events. Obviously there's a crossover here between state and federal jurisdictions and under, I think everyone understands that. But um, I was having a look at some of your digital media minister and it looks like you're an avid supporter of Adelaide Oval. Um, and I was just wondering, in terms of large public events, um, Adelaide Oval's front and centre in that offering, um, how, how are things sitting? Is there federal discussion around how we might see our way to you know, larger gatherings? And do you have any information on that? Yeah, so uh, the National Cabinet sort of agreed to a, a, a three-state roadmap um, that, that laid out um, a process for uh, reopening. Not, um, um, as you got further into the third stage, the looser it kind of became as to, uh, as to what those steps might look like and what was up for consideration at that time. Uh, and that's understandable. The, the, um, the intent behind that uh, is that you know, as each new lot of big public activity resumes again, um, the health officials just want to make sure over a space of a couple of weeks that there's not uh, a spike that flows from that. But we've seen, I think, the, you know, the pressure for things to come back to normal, given, uh, given the absence of cases in a state like SA, um, has seen parts of that roadmap sped up, and I expect that to continue. Um, I think uh, uh, you know, what's probably more important for the industry before we get to the you know, mass gathering Adelaide Oval size is you know, how do we deal with you know, meetings and events, and conferences, and, um, you know, and smaller entertainment propositions and getting those back to a, a point of viability. So I'm very keen to, to see um, uh, you know, discussions that to date have largely centred around you know, how many people can sit down for a meal to how many people can we sit down in, in conference facilities and how do we arrange those things and bring um, that part of, uh, of the sector uh, back to life and do that in you know, sort of up to a hundred or, or maybe more than that if, uh, if the menu is big enough and can apply social distancing sufficiently um, type stage before perhaps then the, uh, the leap into, uh, into some of those big stadia. But it might be that they all move in the same sort of principles-based way at that stage that, um, uh, that with uh, arrangements for seating, you can get some, uh, some further activity um, in, in that space. And certainly, I'd like to be able to get back and have a beer on the hill at Norwood Oval sometime this year uh, um, uh, with appropriate distancing from the others around me, if it's all possible. Thanks, Minister. Um, we had a couple of questions um, next about borders, and, and we've, all, we've already discussed quite a bit of that um, in your opening remarks. Um, I guess, uh, specifically, the, there's two points that maybe you want to touch on further is, with the border openings, obviously, ultimately, it's a state decision. Um, the Prime Minister, yourself, and others have been encouraging state premiers to look at that. Um, is your feeling that it'll be um, a bit by bit in terms of different states or will there be um, a, a decision driven out of national cabinet around a more consistent national approach on that? And the second part is if things remain closed and there's a lack of opportunity for businesses to capture visitors and 
customers that they used to have, be that interstate or international visitors, um, will the government consider that as part of future support um, to help industry stand up? Sure. So I, for the second question first, uh, I mean, essentially, yes, as I, as I said, in terms of encouraging industry engagement in the JobKeeper review, I think an important point that, uh, that you know, needs to be made in starting with the you know, relative certainty that international restrictions will continue is that uh, that is uh, an impediment uh, for many and to be able to fill their business um, and, uh, and, and therefore and there's a need and driven by government restriction uh, for some assistance there. Add to that, um, you know, add to that um, an assumption that some form of social distancing continues and again, that means it's hard uh, to be able to trade at the same volumes that you usually would. Um, and that becomes an argument for, uh, for why, um, again, some form of assistance uh, might still be necessary. Um, and look, if the states keep in place certain state arrangements that, uh, that impede the ability of the people to, uh, to get back to business, that's going to create some challenges at the federal level. You know, if we think the state border restrictions should be coming off, uh, we don't really want to be paying extra as a result of uh, states deciding to keep them on, that we may have a little choice around that. Um, and obviously certain things like, um, uh, like social security safety needs just flow automatically. Uh, and it may be that why we end up having a structure job keeper as a similar type of, uh, of framework in the future, we just have to, uh, have to see. And we want to get out of all of these things as quick as we can, just as I know you all want to get back to business as, as quick as you can. Um, but uh, um, you know, we're not deaf at all to the fact that where there are imposed restrictions by government that impede the ability to do business, well, it's not unreasonable to say you know, we need a bit of a hand to get through that while those restrictions are in place. In terms of what I think the states will do, um, uh, much as I wish uh, that, uh, that I thought we would you know, have a, uh, a date uh, in a month or two's time that they could all agree crystal clear, this is, uh, this is where we'll all just reopen in a normal fashion. I suspect it will end up being a bit more ad hoc than that. I think we will see uh, states uh, make bilateral agreements with one another to reopen between each other because they have confidence around uh, the health stats and so on between those jurisdictions whilst holding out on, uh, on certain other ones. So um, you know, I think you know, be, be, be ready and be agile, I guess, would be my uh, advice to its local operators and they put your pressure back on SATC uh, in that sense as well to make sure that they're ready and agile that, uh, um, that you know, if we uh, open up to, uh, to one or two states only first uh, that you're able to, uh, to try to, uh, to push into, uh, into those markets as quickly as you can. Um, I was talking to Alan Joyce earlier this morning and, and making sure that he understood that, uh, that I thought that was possible and that the, the need for Qantas to be agile around how they reconfigure their network uh, will be important. Um, and I'm chatting again with some of the, uh, the people working on the Virgin administration this afternoon where we'll, we'll make the same point that uh, um, they're going to have to be quick to respond to potential demand that, uh, that comes as, uh, as states make some of these decisions um, uh, in their own way at their own times. Thank you. Um, the next question is about social distancing rules, uh, Minister, and um, it's what is your view on the issue of social distancing rules for tour and transport operators? Overnight, we've seen our state government announce that um, tour and non-essential transport operators, this, the four square metre rule doesn't apply anymore, but there needs to be other mitigations that uh, operators put in place. Um, can you give us any insight in terms of the discussion federally around the four square metre, the 1.5 um, distancing? There appears to be some circumstances where that can be relaxed. Um, could this be applied to other areas of industry, not just tour and transport, but maybe some of that event activity and things like that? Look, I, uh, I think um, over time it, uh, it can be. Um, it, uh, it obviously sort of sits as one of the latter stages of, uh, of the reopening agenda um, and, uh, and um, it may be important if, uh, if certain venues are to shift to, to more of that um, blanket principles approach um, that doesn't have fixed numbers attached to them but sort of lets them calculate what they can do 
and based on responsible numbers in responsible space. Um, I know some jurisdictions have uh, talked about okay, moving from a four square metre to a two square metre, so um, uh, kind of again um, putting in place some controls, but ones to get back to a, a more normalised kind of uh, load factor for uh, the different types of, uh, of businesses. I think there's there's um, community optics that everybody needs to be mindful of at present here too. You would have seen um, uh, as people started to get back to work in, in metropolitan Adelaide um, that the state government had to respond to challenges around numbers of people on public transport and on trains and, and so forth. And so um, you know, I think being mindful of that, although I know in, in all of your cases you're you're wanting to provide visitors with a quality experience where they don't feel like they're packed in, certainly not packed in like they might be on a, uh, on a commuter train. Um, but I think um, expect to see uh, if all goes well, continued opening there. Um, I've asked to have another session talking to uh, the um, uh, Chief Medical Officer and his team at a Commonwealth level uh, around specifically that question. How do we move through the sort of next stage of dealing with that four square metre rule? Because um, uh, it's obviously for many um, businesses, particularly those in transport or those in hospitality, um, that is a real impediment to viability. Uh, and so it's a very conscious there that you've got to be able to have sufficient numbers to be able to be viable in those instances. And um, hoping that we can see that in a sense if we look at the three-step roadmap to date uh, that uh, you know maybe there'll be another three steps that kind of uh, work through those sorts of factors. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'll, uh, I've got a few more questions here. I might skip one or two. Um, in terms of obviously this has been unprecedented in terms of government stimulus and government support for industry and uh, Simon touched on Job keeper, the Prime Minister talked about job maker and um, a reset around how employers and employees and organisers around both of those groups work together. And I think um, we're very supportive of that conversation. It's obviously a, a really tough dynamic to work through, but there's huge opportunity there for everyone. Um, uh, Minister, my question is about stimulus moving forward. Like there's been a significant stimulus, not just for COVID, but we also saw that for the bushfires too. Um, coming, as we move into recovery, um, as the strategy for 2030 starts to take shape, um, can you give us any insight in terms of the government's um, appetite for um, growth stimulus once we get through the health emergency and we move into uh, you know, absolute recovery and, and looking for growth? Sure. Well, we want the we want the economic recovery to be as as strong as possible. Um, but the PM also spoke the other day about you know, the intergenerational responsibilities, which are uh, a balancing act. environmentally. We want to ensure uh, ensure sustainability, uh, but economically as well, it's about ensuring that uh, young people coming through the system today have the best possible chance of getting a job, but that we also don't leave them with uh, with uh, an unwieldy uh, debt um, burden for those generations. And so the spending that we've had to undertake so far is coming at an enormous uh, budgetary cost. And as small business operators, and uh, you're all taxpayers and you understand uh, well and truly that you don't want government uh, imposing uh, those extra imposts on you because of excessive or unnecessary spending. So it's it's a sweet spot that we have to try to, uh, to straddle from here on in. How do we make sure we do enough to, uh, to re-energise um, the economy, uh, to deal with the parts that we face um, suppressed activity for a period of time, but how do we equally uh, you know, do that uh, in a way that doesn't leave lasting um, debt problems? So we'll be working through that in the run-up to, uh, to the October uh, budget. Um, you know, there are some measures that you can see increased to talk about now around how we construction sector, there are the discussions that we've been having about ongoing job keeper matters. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm very conscious that uh, given the hit tourism businesses have, uh, have taken uh, over, uh, over the course of this year, um, and that they often already challenged balance sheets and now quite distressed, 
how do we make sure that we don't have a prolonged investment trap uh, in, in the tourism space? And, uh, uh, and so, uh, for small investments, there are uh, there are things such as the instant asset write-off that uh, that we increased uh, for uh, for this financial year up to one hundred and fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars, and um, um, you know, that is something that you know, that we may well look at um, for uh, for future years in terms of how we encourage those types of small investments that make it more feasible for you um, to, uh, to uh, make certain capital purchases, uh, but for bigger investments as well. I think it's, it's going to be important that we find ways to try to encourage that. The job maker approach overall is one thing you should all expect to hear you know, a lot more about that, uh, that that is pretty much now the prism through which we will be looking at all of our policies. Uh, how do we get the country back to work? Um, whether that's in skills training, whether it's in industrial relations reform that's done in a harmonious way with unions and business at the table, uh, or whether it's in, in other forms of uh, reform or stimulus, uh, other types of things we'll be thinking about. And I should say, whilst the JobKeeper review is about JobKeeper, um, the, the industry should um, use that as an opportunity to highlight um, other longer term factors that to be recommended on the consider too. Thanks, Minister. Two more questions on conscious. We've got a few minutes left. So can I maybe ask you for um, quickly Tourism Australia, obviously um, it's an incredibly important institution and uh, everyone around the country works, um, you know, those operators that are in the international market space work closely with Tourism Australia. Um, it's getting into the domestic marketing space um, through this period, and I think industry is very supportive of that. Um, how do you uh, maybe just quickly touch on Tourism Australia's role now and into the future, Minister? Um, so it is a, a challenging space for uh, the TA. They have, uh, their focus has been on attracting international visitors and leaving the domestic space for, um, uh, for the uh, state tourism organisations to compete over. And we've got to be careful not to trip over one another um, at, uh, at this time and also conscious that uh, the TA needs to be able to scale up internationally um, when we are reopening those international borders. And that's not just going to be a marketing exercise, it's also crucially going to be about how we rebuild aviation activity uh, into Australia, that, uh, that airlines are now all highly distressed in, in terms of their financial states uh, around the world uh, and they will um, all fall over themselves to, uh, to re-establish on highly profitable routes, um, but they'll probably be quite reluctant to re-establish on more marginal routes. And so um, there's a lot of international work uh, for TA to be undertaking as part of the rebuild and relaunch. That said, um, you know, there's a big piece in the interim to try to help with, uh, with domestic activity. Well, as it took the, the mini leap, uh, into that as a response to the bushfire tragedy at the start of the year uh, with some, uh, some committed funds for domestic, which largely TA committed through partnership activities, partnerships with the STOs, partnerships with some of the big, um, uh, big retailers and wholesalers to, to really um, make sure that it was very tactical uh, in where we were investing, um, that it wasn't about building a brand Australia, because uh, Australians kind of know that, but it was about making sure that we got product sold uh, into the places that, uh, that really needed it. I think looking uh, as to different steps as to, uh, as to how TA engages in the domestic campaign before we get to those big uh, international liftoffs, um, it will again be probably a bit more product centric, a bit more partnership focused, um, uh, and that that will be uh, again important to get best value of money um, and not to be duplicating what, uh, what STOs or, or others are doing. There is also, I think, a responsibility, though, for us to, uh, to all be looking quite closely at the parts of the tourism um, uh, industry who are more heavily reliant on international visitation uh, and, uh, and how we make sure that, uh, that we are trying to really stimulate bookings in, uh, into those directions. Um, I, I think once things are sufficiently relaxed, uh, it won't take much encouragement for Australians uh, to flock back to their usual traditional holiday locations. Uh, it's how we get them to look beyond those um, and, uh, and to look at uh, and, um, ticking other items off their bucket lists 
and to make sure that uh, they spend the money that they might have spent on an overseas holiday uh, this year or next year instead on a premium Australian holiday uh, by going to locations and destinations that are a little bit more off the beaten track for your traditional domestic traveller. So uh, I think TA can help to play a role in that sense um, in knowing uh, where we do have that high level of reliance on international and then working with the STOs and regions uh, to, uh, to try to work to drive, drive uh, um, additional business uh, into, uh, into some of those spaces too. Um, last question, Minister. Um, biggest challenge, biggest opportunity over the short term, the next three to six months, how do you, how, what's, your, what's your view on biggest opportunity and biggest challenge? Well, I think biggest opportunity is exactly just what we were talking about. In the end, Australians are massive international travellers um, and, uh, and um, have probably been a bit complacent about um, the amazing tourism experiences that Australia has to offer in recent years. Uh, we uh, attract around 9 million international visitors usually, uh, and that's 9 million people who can't be wrong about it, things that they're coming to do and see. Uh, and so uh, the, the opportunity is an immense one for us to get um, Australia more enthused about travelling across the country uh, and to, uh, to see if we can't really create a bit of a mini boom uh, out of that that, um, that shakes off the depression of, uh, of the last six months and gives people uh, a chance to, to see some real um, economic uh, lift and activity there. And that's going to be a confidence factor across the whole economy. It's not just down to tourism marketing. It is about how we um, shape people to have the confidence to be able to move around. And, uh, um, and, and we're very really conscious of trying to build that as a government. And I'm also conscious that I know in the industry is that the, the public messaging is a sensitive one when you've got much higher rates of unemployment, um, much higher levels of business failure that, uh, that we've also you know, got to be mindful when we're out encouraging people to take a holiday that not everybody can uh, and, uh, and we get that pitch and that message right. Um, you know, the, biggest, the biggest challenge I think is um, going to be how do we reopen internationally in a safe way. Um, if there's one thing that causes me to wake up in the middle of the night with a cold sweat, it's kind of the, what if it takes years to get a vaccine? Um, what happens then in terms of how a country like Australia that has successfully contained this thing manages it relative to other parts of the world that sort of have seen it you know, flood through their communities and, uh, and um, whilst it will be interesting to see whether they have second spikes, um, you know, it, uh, it is probably easier for them in some ways to uh, conceive of reopening with or without a vaccine type solution coming along. And so uh, I hope, um, and some of the best scientists we've got in the country tell me they're optimistic uh, about the potential for that vaccine breakthrough. And, uh, and if that's the case, that'll enable us to return to, to normal as, uh, as quick as we can. But um, uh, if it takes a little while, uh, then it's going to be quite a challenge as we try to look beyond New Zealand and work out how we do with our international connectivity beyond that. Thanks so much, Minister. We really, really great, gratefully appreciate your time. Um, I think confidence is king, as you have highlighted, and um, ha making yourself available to talk with you know, the SME sector across the state um, today really helps um, industry understand the thinking of government and it, and it drives confidence because people have got a better insight in terms of how they can take their business forward. So thank you so much, um, uh, Minister for Trade, Tourism, Investment, Simon Birmingham and South Australian Senator. That concludes our session today, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out to join the session. We've recorded this session and we'll make it available. We'll send out a, um, an email to everyone that attended um, with uh, a link to the recording and also some of the programs that I've talked about earlier. Thank you again and uh, have a great day and we'll see you all soon. Thanks everyone, all the best. See you.